Welcome to another session of the 2020 GAPAC Virtual Conference. We are a festival of ideas using open government data to make our communities better places. GAPAC is an international competition for people of all abilities who seek to make life better through open data. In two weeks time, on the weekend of 14th to 16th of August, thousands of people come together in what has become one of the world's largest open data competitions. This evening, we will hear from Logan McClintock from Australian Tax Office. Logan will introduce the M4 macro processor, which was developed by the same authors of the C language and can be used along with your favorite flavor of programming language. Welcome, Logan. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to GovHack. And yes, I'm going to be presenting on M4. So firstly, why M4? So M4 is very old school, 1977. That is actually the year that um, the Commodore computer was the first um, home computer. So this is a very long time ago. Um, now, M4 was actually written by KNR, Brian Kernigan and Dennis Ritchie. Um, you would probably recognize them from the famous um, computer book, the C programming language. Uh, I've got the second edition here, but um, this is undoubtedly probably one of the most um, famous computer books ever written which gives you an idea of the caliber of um, M4. So in those days, computers didn't have much power and design was everything. So as you know, from you know, the Unix philosophy and everything, how languages were designed was very, very important in those days, especially because of the um, the computers were not very powerful. Um, now, macro processing, what, what is that about anyway? So when we use the term macro in the Unix world, we are talking about text to text replacement. Um, I'm not talking about macros like uh, Visual Basic or anything like that. This is simply text to text replacement. Now, they were used a lot in the old days when um, code was written in assembly. So there's a bit of history there. Now, M4, this is the manual for M4, written by the same authors. And the bit I want to show you is that it's five pages long. Now, if you compare that to C, which is, I think, 272 pages. So gives you an idea that M4 is quite simple. It only has 21 built-in commands and I only use about half of them. So you, you don't need to learn much um, to use M4. The amazing thing about M4 is it works with any text. It does not matter if you mix it with another language. So you can use it with C. I mean, C has its own preprocessor, which you know has macros, but it's not as powerful as M4. You could use it with any other language, SQL, Python, R, any language. You could even use it without, without a language. So just straight text files, um, it's a part of the POSIX standard. So that means that every computer except for Windows has M4. So it's something that is pretty universal. Um, you could probably find a, a version for Windows if you weren't looking for it. It's Turing complete. So it gives you an idea that it's not just a simple find and replace is a very powerful macro processor. And the thing I love most about M4 is it's easy to learn, but you get a lot of power from the usage. 
and it, it's power that you can apply anywhere to any type of text document. So now when to use M4. So languages that don't have macros, like I said, C already has macros, so you probably wouldn't bother. But lots of languages don't. And some languages have macros, but they're really not very good. So SQL, depending on the implementation, there normally is some type of macro um, ability, but it's normally very basic stuff, like you change a number from five to six or something like that. You can't do crazy things like change data types, change table names, these sorts of things. When functions are slow, so normally we're all taught to use functions. Functions are great because, you know, they check data types, you know, you get return values, you can use a debugger, all these cool things. Um, and they keep the program modular, right? But they're not always cool because there's always a cost in executing a function just because the control, the, the flow, the control is going into a function. So even in C, if you're gonna put a function call in a loop, that would start to become costly. Um, so you really want to use macros in loops as a general rule. Um, yeah, repetitive code. So. Like I said, you can use functions to, to make code more modular, but sometimes they're not available or they're slow. So you can use M4 macros the same way. So you can make macros to um, try and strip out the repetitive code. Now, in the wild today, this is the main use case of M4 is as what they call a domain specific language. This is basically when you roll your own language. And this normally happens when you have to deal with a painful language, like think of LaTeX. I love the documents LaTeX makes, beautiful. But the language is very painful. And you find yourself just, you learn a few things that work and you stick in that little corner. You don't go crazy, you know, typing, you know, so this is a perfect use case for a domain specific language. So you can use M4 and make macros with the few things that you actually do need, you know, setting up a document, inserting pictures, adding chapters, these things. And then once you've done that, you can put that aside and you're free then to use your own language, which constitutes of these M4 macros. This is a very useful um, thing and it's used a lot in things like HTML, these sorts of things. So where do we use M4 in the ATO? M4 was used a lot making A-Life. So you might've heard of A-Life. A-Life is a longitudinal data set with data back to 1991. Um, you can imagine how things have changed since 1991. Lots of changes in the collection, the processing and the storing of data. So you think about tax returns, questions change, computers change, data systems, you name it. The changes are huge. And back in 1991, things were done differently just because computers were less powerful, storage was more expensive. So one of the hard things about this project was going through all the data and trying to put it together in a homogeneous longitudinal file. And what was starting to happen is it became apparent that lots of the data was fairly similar, but just slightly different. There might be data type changes or table name changes or some type of change that SQL macros could not handle. But M4 can handle easily because it just works on text. It doesn't care about SQL. So it was a real saver. Now, to give you an idea, 
I expanded one file. Now it was written in M4 and SQL and it was 737 lines. After it was expanded with M4, it became 84,000 lines of SQL, 84,000 lines. That's just one file. The actual whole repository is 17,000 lines of M4 and SQL. You could imagine what that would be all expanded. Huge. It would be unmanageable. Imagine looking for bugs, trying to make updates. It would be unmanageable. So this is where M4 is amazing. The other thing it's amazing for is writing dynamic SQL. So it's easy to write SQL. It's very verbose. It's very you know straightforward. But when you have data that's changing from year to year, you don't want to have a whole column like full of nulls because there is no data there. You want to just get what is relevant to that particular year. So what you want to do is you want to look in the data and actually see what's there. And then that changes the code you want to run to do the extraction. So dynamic SQL is just a fancy name for SQL that writes SQL that then does what you want. M4 is very useful in this process as like the glue to stick it all together. So, um, and then finally, yeah, testing code. So when you see people testing code, right, you'll often see they'll have like two versions and one version they will do these things and the other version will, they'll do these things. And then they find a bug in one of the versions, they fix it and then they forget to fix the other bug in the other one. And they're actually managing multiple copies of this, pretty much the same thing. They're just taking different paths through the testing. This can be all avoided with M4. So you can use definitions. You can divide, define like path one or test one and then use if def. So you go, if defined test one, we'll do this. Or if defined test two, we'll do this. And you can maintain one version of the source code. It's a lot more efficient. I'm not talking about like version control here. I'm actually, version control is very useful as well. But I'm talking about one version of the file. By changing the definitions, you can do different executions. Okay, so people say M4 is difficult. Why is that? Um, and I've talked to some people that have tried M4. A lot of people, I think, they get stuck on the recursive expansion. So M4 will expand a macro to its definition, but then that expanded text will get scanned again. And if it finds another macro, it'll do it again. And it just keeps recursively expanding, expanding, expanding until there's nothing more to expand. Now, this catches a lot of people out because they might have um, used macro names without realizing, and they're getting expansion that they, that, and it just, you know, kind of drives people crazy. So now to fix this problem, you can use quotes. So you, things that you don't want expanded, you can protect them with quotes. So it's an easy thing to work around when you know. And in fact, this two things about the recursive expansion and the quoting is the, the main thing that I'm gonna focus on in the tutorial part that's coming. Now, the other thing is M4 is just text to text, right? So there's no fancy debugging. And this is another thing that deters people. But there actually is some debugging because if you've got a macro, you can actually look to see what its definition is. And you can also run it to expand it. So using that, you actually can do debugging and um, dump def, which basically shows you the definition without expanding is essential, especially um, when you're developing. So the built in macros we will cover are these ones. Don't worry um, about memorizing this. 
Um, and I'm going to give the notes as well at the end of the presentation, so no worries about that. But you can see that there's only a handful of things to learn, and then you've got a very powerful tool. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you by reading, but I just want to read a little bit. And I found my favourite chapter in the five-page manual. So here it goes. The basic operation of M4 is to copy its input to its output. As the input is read, however, each alphanumeric token, that is a string of letters and digits, is checked. If it is the name of a macro, then the name of the macro is replaced by its defining text, and the resulting string is pushed back onto the input to be re-scanned. Macros may be called with arguments, in which case the arguments are collected and substituted into the right places in the defining text before it is re-scanned. So the essential thing there is that's where that recursive nature comes from. It's from re-scanning. M4 is ingenious by its design in the sense that it just reads from input. It has an input buffer that just keeps reading from, takes the tokens, it looks to see if it's a macro, if it is, expands it, it might have parameters, it gets them, and then it pushes it back into the input and scans it again. And this is where you get that recursive nature from, and also is what makes M4 very powerful. Okay, so let's get cracking. Um, I'm going to start basically a tutorial. Um, on this other window here, I'm going to run M4 interactively, which is something you normally wouldn't do much, to be honest. You would normally have this code in a text file somewhere and you'd work on it and you'd run the whole text file. But um, interactive is very good for demonstrations and it's also good for just playing around to see how the language works. So here I'm going to define some macros. Defined A to be B, B to be C, C to be D, D to be E. And you notice it, it gave me all this, these new lines here. That's because when it evaluates define, the define itself, the output of that is just an empty string. So it disappears. But the new line character at the end is retained. That's why we get the one, two, three, four. We get the four new line characters here. So um, that's actually a good thing, though. It makes the language powerful that you, you can define things kind of anywhere, even in the body of a line. It doesn't have to be on its own line. So if I run A now, what will we get? E. Yes. So that is the recursive expansion. A expands to B. It's pushed back on the input, read, rescanned. B to C, rescan, and it just keeps doing this until there's nothing more to expand, and we end up with E. Now, imagine that these defines were a long way away and this is big source code and you've forgotten all about this and you're like what a is e this is where dump def saves you so dump def lets you see what these things are defined as without expanding so you see a is b b is c c is d d is e so that's a very useful this is basically the debugging um, facility in M4. Okay. Now, I kind of thought of throwing everyone in the deep end. And I thought if you understand this macro, then you're pretty much done because in the real life, you're not going to get anything more tricky than this. So here, we're defining yep but we're defining yep as itself another define. And then in this define, we're defining x to be 12. So let's do a dump def to see what actually just happened. 
oh, this is interesting. So it's thrown an error. It said undefined macro X. And then it's got, yep, is actually define X12. Interesting. So what's happening here is because there were quotes on this, when this was run, one set of quotes got stripped. And because of that, the define itself has not executed yet. So that's why yep is itself this with the quotes missing because the quotes got eaten when, when this was collected. And X is not defined yet. So then if we run some text here, X goes to X because it's not it's just, it's not defined. Yep goes to the empty string because this will get executed now and defines output an empty string. And then there's the two spaces, which is the space here and the space there. And then when this gets executed, now X will be defined as 12. So when the second X is encountered, it will get replaced with 12. So let's run the dump def again to see that. You see that X is now 12 and yep is unchanged. Okay. Now let's do the next one, which is similar, but a little bit different. So we define ye to be defined k is 12. Now let's do the dump def to see what's happening. It's got k is 12, but ye is empty string. Now that's because it was, there were no quotes here. Done. This got expanded, got executed. k got defined and this outputted the empty string. So that's why ye is the empty string and k is 12. If we run some text, you'll see K goes to 12, Y goes to empty string, K goes to 12. And dump def again, you'll see nothing's changed. Okay. Now let's have a little bit of fun. I'm going to define X as 13. And then I'm going to go X. Any guesses what's going to happen? Wow, you can't answer me, but 12. But I just told it it's 13. It's because the X here was not quoted. X is already defined to be 12. You can see it up here, it's 12. X is 12. So when it encounters X, it automatically will swap it to 12 and then it tries to define 12 to be 13, which is not going to work. And so that's why X is still 12. Okay. So, oops, wrong window. Okay. So how do we fix this? Well, we need to add in the quotes. Now, when we do X, it's 13. So it's, it's really is a good habit to get into M4 when you're defining things to, to use the quotes on, on the left-hand side is a very good thing to do. All right, now continuing on with the demo, I'm gonna redefine, yep, notice that quotes here were necessary because if I didn't do that, it would have went and got yep and put yep in and just be a big mess. <laughs> So we need quotes here and I've put quotes around the define as well. Okay. So now we do the dump def. So you can see that X is the old 13 hasn't changed from before 12 is not executed yet. And one set of quotes gets stripped. So we end up with literally define as the, the, the definition of yet. So now when I run it, run some text. X is the old 13. Yep, 
now will be this, and then that will be executed. This will return the empty string. So there's nothing in there. But as a result of doing this, X is defined as 12 now, and so now X is 12. So, okay. Now, the real power of macros is the ability to write these functions and have parameters for the functions. It's super cool because something you can't do with a simple find and replace. So let's look at a define here. I'll define cool to be hello. There's no parameters in here. Cool does not take parameters. So if I call cool and give it a parameter, what will happen? So I called cool and I gave it this parameter in here, but cool is not defined to accept parameters. So it just puts it in the rubbish. It's okay. Now let's actually define some parameters now. So I'm gonna make another macro called rabbit. And then this is the, the definition of rabbit. Now rabbit takes these two parameters, one and two. They use the dollar sign notation. So dollar sign one up to dollar sign nine. You can take nine um, parameters. So it, they're positional parameters. It'll make more sense when I call the macro. So I call rabbit with carrots and ginger. Carrots will go into where the dollar sign one is, which you can see in the output here. And ginger will be substituted in where the two is, which you can see in the output there. Now, it, it doesn't matter how many times you use these things um, and they don't have to be in order either. Like in the definition, they don't have to be in order, but one will always be when you call it the first parameter two will be the second when you call it. So I will redefine rabbit. Note that the quotes here are essential because if I didn't do that, it would expand and I would get all the rabbit things. <laughs> and I'm gonna use the first parameter another time. So now when I call it, I like carrots, carrots has gone in here and ginger. I really like carrots. We've used carrots a second time. You can, you can go crazy with these things. Right. Now, it's really powerful to interact with the shell because it, you know, M4 has 21 built-in macros. The shell, you can do so many things as programs for everything you can imagine. So there's no point in adding all that into M4. You just make a way for it to interact with the shell. And then you can just do what you want through the shell. So that's what this esys command is about. It, it runs a shell command and then captures the output and brings it back into M4. So here's an example. I've run esys command with the host name. So this is like running host name on the shell. And because it's a Dell computer, it's set to Dell, right? But you notice I get this new line here, which is kind of annoying if I wanna use, say this in, in the middle of a sentence. So we wanna get rid of that new line, but we can easily do that because we're on the shell. So here I just, Call host name and piped it to TR and deleted the new line character. So now we don't have that anymore. Now that's that's cool, but let's give this a name so we can use it whenever we want. So I'm going to call it my computer. And I make I'm going to define my computer to be this ESIS command call, which gets the host name. 
and let's do a dump diff. And you can see that it's Dell. Cool. But you see that this is hard coded as Dell. The actual ESIS command is gone. It's because it got evaluated. It's because there's no quotes here. So let's do another example of counting the files in um, the directory I'm currently in. So here I'm going to find all the files and count them in in this in my current directory. So there's only one file in here, which actually is this text file I'm using. So, and likewise, I can give this a name as a macro. So I'm going to call it count files, and I'm going to run this command. And count files, of course, gives one because we know that. Now I'm going to run a system command. This time, you notice it's just a system command, it's not the esys command. We're not going to capture the output here. It's just going to run the command. So we're going to create an empty file called test file. So now there should be two files now, but we're still going to get one. Why? Well, let's do some debugging. It's because Um, count files is hard coded as one. So it's not re counting the files anymore in the directory. So what we need to do is fix this. And we um, need to add in the quotes here because count files is already defined. So if we didn't have quotes here, we'd be in trouble. And we put quotes around the ESIS command so that when we do look at the dump dev, you can see count files is now the command. Quotes have been stripped off to protect it. Okay. Now we run it and we get the correct answer too. Let's make one more empty file in the directory. Now we should get three and we do. Fantastic. So you can see working with M4, it is actually really useful to work interactively until you get your macros stable and then you start put your macros in your big scripts and things. You'll have a lot less dramas that way. Okay. Now, I'm going to make a file using the sys command. So I just created a file called t3. And I put the text hello world in that file. This is one of M4's most useful. It's this very simple command, but it's so useful. It's just including text from another file. And it's such a powerful thing. So here, M4 says include T3. So I'm including this file that I just created. And it opens this and pulls in the text that I put in there. So M4 says, hello world. <laughs> now, I don't actually use this much. But M4 can do mathematics which is cool because normally I'm using M4 as a wrapper on some other language. And that other language has its own mathematics, which is, is probably more, you know, familiar to me. So I just use that. But um, M4 has its own math, which is super useful if you were using M4 with just like normal text files. Um, it's very useful. So let's do some maths. Of course, the answer is two. Now, any guesses for the answer to this? C programmers will know the answer straight away. Of course, the answer is two, right? <laughs> it's, it's because um, two goes into five twice um, with the remainder of one. So you can also define a macro to be a number. 
and then do maths with that macro. So here I define P to be five and we add seven, we get 12. Great. So diversions. Diversions are very, 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 very useful. The main thing that diversions are used for is for separating all your defines. Because as you noticed, when you run a define, the define itself disappears to an empty string, but that the new line character at the end stays. So if you've got like 20 defines at the top of your source code, after you've done the macro expansion, you're gonna end up with all this white space super annoying but it's really cool that you can define stuff wherever you want so that's the reason why it's like that so m4 has different outputs and they're called diversions now diversion zero is the main output that you see so when you see things coming out that's that's zero but you can use one to nine to basically store output in a temporary file. And then you can pull it back when you want and you can change the order of pulling it back or just not even bother pulling it back. You leave it there and it doesn't get used. But you can also divert to negative one, which is just like throwing it away. So when you divert to negative one, it's really useful for a block comment. The, the macros will still get processed, but the output will be thrown away. So you'll often see at the top of a file that uses M4, divert negative one. That's basically like start a block comment. And then when it's finished, you'll see divert zero or just divert. Because if there's no number, it, it defaults to zero, which brings it back to the normal output. So here, is my block comment divert negative one, we're throwing it away, but the define will still run. And then here we come back to the normal output. So if I go G, it will be 19. But you see, I still get this, this space, uh, not space, sorry, new line, which comes from here. It comes from the new line at the end here. So we need to get rid of that. To get rid of that, there's a macro called dnl the dnl means discard to the new line and including the new line so here you see that that new line's gone but you see i've got the space in here space has come through so to really do the job well with block quotes the way to do it is like this so you Divert to negative one. Stuff in here will be processed, but the output will not will, will be discarded. Yep. So here, and I've got this DNL butted up against here, and everything's gone. G is here with no white space. So this is oh, this is normally the way you'll see it done. Uh, and just to reiterate, um, the DNL is is basically like a one line comment. Okay, so we've got the block comments and the one line comments, but let's have some fun with the diversions. So the div num or the diversion number tells you which diversion you're currently in. So when you're seeing the output is zero, but you can get lost in which diversion you're up to. So it's a useful thing to have. So let's go crazy and do some diversions. So here I went to diversion nine and I put this stuff in there. Then I went to four and I put this in there. I went to six and I put that in there and then I came back to the normal output. So you remember these other ones, they're just other outputs and it's puts it at the end as like basically temporary storage. Now we can pull it back. You can undervert. So I can pull back six and here it is. You can see that was six. 
and so on and so forth. And you can pull back multiple ones together. So I'll pull back nine and then four. You'll notice that the nine here got expanded because I used the div num here. And because I was in div num nine, it expanded to nine. And here expanded to four, this div num here because I was in four. So this is pretty cool stuff. Do you see I've changed the order? Very useful, very useful. Now, if depths, if depths is probably one of the features I use the most, but for that reason I told you earlier of taking different paths through a file. So you might wanna, for different testing or for like optimization, you might wanna take one path to test the theory, and then you want to take a different path to test another theory to see maybe which one is, is more efficient. Um, instead of maintaining two files, it's easier to use the if def suit. So it's very useful. So I'm going to define goat as elephant. And I'm going to go if goat is defined, then we give this true text. Wow, it's defined. Or we go, no, no, not defined. And we get no. You're like, wait a second, what? what? I just defined goat. <laughs> well, you should know by now what's happening. Goat gets expanded to elephant. And then elephant is not defined. So that's why it says nope. So you can see here, goat is elephant. If we want this to work the way we're expecting, we need the quotes to protect goat. So now it's saying goat is defined. Wow, defined, cool. Um, there's also if else. So I'm defining QWERTY to be standard it kind of is standard and a bit more used than Dvorak. <laughs> um, and then when we run the if else, you notice we get the true text. So this is a curious thing. This is what we wanted. So here we deliberately don't want quotes here because we do want QWERTY to be expanded to standard so that the comparison becomes standard and standard and then we get the true if we had quotes here it would literally compare qwerty to standard which is not what we were expecting here so sometimes you don't want quotes it's not always you have to um, experiment now the the default quotes um, in m4 is the back tick and then the, the single quote. Now, the problem with that is they often conflict with other programming languages because other programming languages use those symbols quite a lot. Now, you can change the quotes. So the good idea is if you're gonna use M4 as a wrapper for some other language, look at the syntax of that language and try and find something for the quotes that is not used or not used very often. Um, you do want the left and the right quotes to be different because it, it does make things a lot nicer. So I often um, use M4 with SQL. So the, um, the square braces or square brackets are not used that I can think of. Um, so it's a good choice. So let's change the quotes. Once the quotes are changed, it's just the same as it was before. So we can define S to be this. Um, S is two. We look at the dump def of S, you see it's a vowel. So one lot of quotes got stripped, which is what we we're expecting. And then this gets rescanned, evaluated to two. Beautiful. Um, you can double quote. What happens then? 
So we just double quoted, note the quotes here are needed because otherwise it would get expanded. Then S is literally eval one plus one. And the dump def, you notice that the definition has a quote. So when this gets rescanned, the quotes will get stripped and then nothing will actually happen. This will go to the output as eval one plus one. It will never be um, expanded to two. So double quotes are sometimes useful as well. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to finish the um, interactive M4. And I'm going to give a demo on writing dynamic SQL. So this is something um, we do a lot in the ATO. And I'm, I'm just gonna do this as like a tutorial. So in real life, you would put all this in script and you would automate it. And you know, you would schedule it using cron or something like that. But here I'm just gonna actually do it interactively, which is still a useful skill to know for when you're developing things um, before you start putting things in scripts and stuff because it's easier to find bugs and, and those things. So going to create an SQL um, database, SQLite, and the database is test DB. And then I'm going to create a table. Tables just for some dummy data. I've got tables called dog. And I'm going to have some IDs in there. And then some items, which are just letters. And amounts, which are just numbers that are for these letters. So the data doesn't mean anything in particular. And then I'm going to insert some data into that table. Okay, and let's make things look pretty. Just turning the headers on. Um, and then we can see the, the data. So we've got IDs, items, and amounts. So this is a simple example, but what I wanna do is I wanna actually flatten this data or transfer form it or whatever you transpose, whatever you want to call it. But I want to take the items, I normally use the term flatten. Items here, I want to become the columns. And then I just want the amounts and the IDs here. So instead of being a long data set, I want it to be across the top. So each item in the columns and then the amounts. But Imagine we've got different data all the time and the, the, the items are changing all the time. I don't want to hard code it. I don't want to have to say like A is column one and B is column two. I want the SQL to be dynamic. I want it to actually ask the question and say, well, which items do we have in here? And then, okay, that's going to become my columns. So that's what I'm going to do. Just going to turn the headers off for a second. And then I'm going to run this query here. So this is going to get SQL to write to a file called flatten SQL. And it's going to run this query. Basically, this query is the SQL is writing some SQL lines here. And it's going to do this for each of the items that are unique um, in this table. And it's going to then bring the output back and then quit from the database. So. so we can see that it's created that file. When I cut the file. So that was the purpose of doing that is the SQL went, okay. So for each item that's in this dog table, I'm gonna write this SQL line there's the SQL lines here. 
And this is just SQL for flattening. Right? Now we can use M4 to glue it together. So I told you that this include macro in M4 is super useful. Now that's, that's all we're actually using M4 here. I mean, in real life, you'd have other macros that do other things, but simple example. So let's run M4 interactively. And I'll run this and you'll see that the include has sucked in that SQL. So now I have a, the query that I want here. It's select and it's going to flatten that data. Okay. Now you, you oh, when you're in interactive M4, you just press control C to get out of it. Now, normally you'd put this in a script or something, but I'm going to use a, a here doc to run it into M4. Okay, and then you see it worked. We got our expansion, which is what we want. But remember, M4 is just text and text. It doesn't care about SQL, doesn't do any of that stuff. So we need to then feed that into the database to get the answer we want. So here, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get our M4 and then pipe it into the SQLite database that we created. And voila, data is flattened. So you can see that the IDs are on the left, one and two, and the items have become our columns. And the data is in there. And, and if there is no item, it's a null in there. Here is a null and here is a null. So you can see that nowhere did I say that I wanted A, B, C, D. I didn't say that. If there were different items and we ran this process again, we would get we would get different columns here. So dynamic SQL is very, very powerful and is very necessary when you're doing things like a life data back to 1991. Okay, so I've just got some final notes here. Um, so like I said, the macros you can put anywhere you can embed them in documents and things. But normally what you do is you have one file where you put most of your macros. It just keeps it nice and clean. And then when you run M4, that, that file is the first one you specify. And then after that, you normally have your code and you might have some more macros to find in there. But here you're basically just using the macros you defined previously. Just makes things a bit cleaner. Um, now with M4, you can have as many files here as you want. You can have 10 or as many as you want. It, uh, it process, processes them in order and macros are defined as they are encountered. Remember, it just reads from that input. It's like a hamster on the wheel. It just reads from that input. Um, so it will do things as the order that you give it. Um, and then you can save the output and run it through your program, or you could pipe it straight into your program. Um, now, thank you for watching everybody. I uh, hope you learned some tricks. And when you think about the five pages and the power that M4 gives you, I hope it's something that you do feel inspired to learn and it might help you out in your competition. So many thanks, and I hope that was educational. Thank you. <clears throat> questions, um, send them through if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Logan. Um, I, I love that you, um, I love that you can use that alongside any other language as well. So I'm sure it's an extra tool that our hackers can use along with their existing toolkits. Uh, during the GovHack competition.
Um, and you, you set your example there about the 700 lines of a um, file being expanded to 84,000, I think it was, lines yep. of SQL. That's correct. Yeah. Made sense with the recursive um, uh, processing. Yes. So, something I would say a limitation of other macros and templating processes you mentioned only doing it once. So the recursive is definitely a advantage there. <clears throat> yes, that's spot on. Yeah, I, I also see the advantage of learning it alongside. So someone entry level learning languages and starting off maybe potentially data science or even just coding. So alongside other languages like Python and R, because that recursive um, on data sets would be in, invaluable that they could get a lot more done uh, with the data before they start playing with their own code and worry about the actual analysis um, after. Yeah. Um, and and m is, is very powerful. And I think that you are really appreciate it when you've had a problem that gets ugly. And when you've had a problem that gets ugly and your code starts blowing out and you start looking in that language for solution. And sometimes there just is none. And that's when you really appreciate M4. It, it can come and it really can be a game changer, which it was for Alive. So, um, but even for simple things like, um, you know, if you're just messing around in HTML or something, it kind of is fun to create your own domain specific language and a bit, a bit of fun. Yeah, awesome. And and this is all assuming the uh, coder can get their head around the uh, the goats and the elephants and the goats <laughs> there. So, yeah, I, I hope uh, the notes um, will be up there for you to access. So um, you can kind of go through it again a bit slower and think about it. And, yeah, awesome. Um, so. In addition, we've got um, our virtual conference talks happening um, over the last week and this week. So we have a series of uh, connection events coming up as well for each state. So coming up tomorrow afternoon, there will be a virtual conference events for Victoria and Queensland at 5.30 and 6, per 6 p.m. respectively in their local time zones. Um, we also have a session with CSIRO on Friday at 3 p.m. Sydney time, where they discuss the available open data CSIRO has to offer. So thank you again, Logan. It was a great presentation. Thank you. It's my pleasure.